Welcome to the 2020 Pitchfork Challenge Finals. We're so happy you decided to join us today and we hope you're having a great radically rural experience so far. I'm Sarah Powell, the Program Director here at the Hannah Grimes Center for Entrepreneurship and I've had the great pleasure of working with the entrepreneurs presenting here today for the past eight weeks and we're really excited to support them here today and hear their final pitches. Today's session would not be possible without the support of many people, including Mascoma Bank, who is a sponsor for the Entrepreneur Track this year at Radically Rural, and the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority, who has generously donated the $11,000 in prize money for the Pitchfork Challenge winners here today. The Pitchfork Challenge is a business pitch competition focused on supporting the rural entrepreneurial ecosystem. It was intentionally created to provide money and momentum to increase the rate of rural startups by supporting the idea phase and the early challenging years of being a small rural business. We created the Pitchfork program in 2016 in response to the low startup rates in rural areas after the Great Recession. This is not just another pitch competition though, but a great way to jumpstart ideas, connections, and small businesses in communities. Today's session will have three parts. The first session, we will hear all the pitches from our contestants. During the second part, we will move into a discussion with the organizers of Pitchfork about how you can take this concept home to your community. And then the third and final part of the session will end with an announcement of the winners and the presentation of awards. There'll be $1,000 for the idea pitch today and $10,000 for the small business pitch winner. Spoiler alert, one of our idea track pitchers decided to take a step back from the competition. So our lone idea track person presenting here today will receive the prize. She's very deserving and we're really excited to hear her final pitch today. I'd like to introduce our judges for today's event. Uh, Jim Verzino is the president and CFO of Food Creators Financial. We have Susan Newcomer, the Director of Leadership Monadnock, and we have Brittany McNault, the founder of The Bread Shed, Damian Wasserbauer, a founder of Wasserbauer IP Law, and Roy Wallen, the CEO of Directional Healthcare Advisors. The wonderful MC for today's event is Pooja Thapa. Pooja is an international student from Nepal studying at Keene State College. Pooja's majoring in business management and minoring in studio art and women's and gender studies. Pooja aims to be involved in nonprofit organizations and to pursue a career in entrepreneurship. We're really excited that she can be here today. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Pooja to get this event started. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. The people presenting here have been working hard to hone their business pitch over the last eight weeks. And today here, they're gonna be presenting for the final time. There are two pitch, uh, there are two tracks for the Pitchfork Challenge. The first track is the idea track. It represents a very new business idea or someone who's in the idea phase of the entrepreneurial journey. The second track is the small business track. There are businesses that are more established. The idea presenter here today will, be, uh, will have two minutes for the pitch, followed by two minutes of Q&A with the judges. Between all the pitches today, we'll have one minute for scoring and transition. All right, let's get started with our idea phase and welcome our business idea presenter, Margaret Foster. <laughs> Margaret Foster will be presenting Little Lantern Pediatrics Group Consulting today. Hello, my name is Margaret Foster and I'm a mother, early childhood educator and a pediatric sleep consultant. For many families, sleep is a big struggle, and there's little in the way of support for them in our community. So seeing this need, I decided to become certified through the Family Sleep Institute, which is a, a leader in pediatric sleep consulting, trusted and endorsed by pediatricians around the world. And as of now, I'm the only pediatric sleep consultant in our region. 
I, um, I'm, um, and so far I've supported three volunteer clients during my training and I've had my first paid client and I'm happy to say that all of them have met their sleep goals. I'm starting a, uh, I'm starting a LLC called Little Lantern Pediatric Sleep Consulting. My goal is to be family's guiding light, cutting through the often contradictory advice available to the modern family about sleep and giving them evidence-based methods with, um, with support every step of the way. Through my website, I offer service packages that range from 15-minute conversations up to individualized step-by-step -step plans with two weeks of support. And these prices range between $15 to $375. I will use the $1,000 to get professional support with my branding and website as well as, um, as, well as uh, marketing through Facebook and Instagram and locally with, uh, with print and rec cards. And I would, um, I'm already taking a business course in which I will um, learn how to use to this uh, money really strategically. Restorative sleep sets children up for healthy development. It creates warmer, more connected home lives and it eases postpartum depression, which is particularly common in our area as it is rural. Um, and so, and this is especially important in uh, our current crisis due to COVID-19. Thank you for listening. My name is Margaret Foster and my business is Little Lantern Pediatric Sleep Consulting. Thank you, Margaret, for sharing your idea with us. It's time to hear from our judges for the two minutes Q&A. Margaret, can you just give us a quick snippet of what it's like when you're talking to a family? So usually when a family is coming to me, you know, they're really in a place where they're really struggling. You know, they may not have been sleeping for many nights in a row, so they're really tired. And when I work with them, you know, I really am listening. That's the main thing I do is I really listen to the families and hear where they're coming from, really try to come from a place of not judging them and just offering um, these solutions and um, ideas in collaboration with them so that they can feel comfortable and confident because the two most important aspects are confidence and, um, and uh, confidence and consistency. So, yeah. So how has your um, business been affected by COVID? Because I'm guessing when you had the idea to start this business, COVID didn't exist. In how does that affect it? How are you going to go forward? Yeah, so it is kind of a little bit challenging because it really is all about relationships, this industry. So it, it really, it's harder to go out and to keen, for example, and have a, um, you know, a seminar where I'm talking to people in person. Um, fortunately, you know, the internet is such a great resource in these times. And so I'm able to do webinars and other things, you know, a lot, like all my business is really driven through my website. So it, it's actually the perfect kind of model for COVID because it's already, you know, it would be nice to be more out in the community, which I plan to be, but as for now, it really works. So. Have you assessed how many families can be impacted by your business? How big your market is, at least when you get started? Yeah, you know, um, this area is like, I really want to focus locally because, you know, I know that this area is, there's not really anybody available. So um, in terms of finding families, it's really just getting my name out there. And, you know, the market is is pretty, is not saturated at all in this area. So that's really where I, I think um, I can find a lot of parents who are struggling. And I know that it's really common, you know, even just now I had someone tell me that their family member is struggling, you know, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty common. Well, thank you, Margaret, for your pitch today, and thank you, judges, for your questions. Next, four entrepreneurs will be presenting for six minutes for their chance to win $10,000. And this will be followed by five minutes of Q&A with the judges. Without further ado, let's welcome our first pre presenter. Our first presenter is Linda Rubin, and she's presenting Frisky Cow Gelato. Everyone 
knows you can't buy happiness, but you can buy Frisky Cow Gelato, which is pretty much the same thing. My name is Linda Rubin, and I've been making premium artisan gelato right here in Keene since 2018. Our gelato is made entirely from scratch, and all our fl flavor creams and syrups are homemade. You will taste the difference. From the first bite to the last, Frisky Cow Gelato delivers everything folks are looking for in a premium ice cream, and with half the saturated fat. Our gelato is made from a proprietary base that starts with fresh, local, organic milk. Pre-made mixes are never used, and all of our flavor creams and syrups are homemade. Frisky Cow Gelato is not only made in your backyard, but it's made with the finest local ingredients. Terra Nova coffee, strawberries from Stonewall Farm, maple butter from Ben's Sugar, Sh Sugar Shack, and 15%, 15 cents from the sale of every pint is donated to nonprofit organizations who are dedicated to building our local food system. We are a great food with a compelling mission to be the best tasting, highest quality gelato money can buy and benefit our community, the local economy, and the environment. 85% of our business is selling gelato wholesale to 35 retail outlets in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont. 15% involve selling gelato at, vet, at events. That part of the business, when the pandemic hit, ended. We really wanted to replace that revenue, and so we launched the Frisky Cow Gelato Club. Currently, 60 club members pre-order our specialty flavors and pick up their weekly gelato at the Keene Farmer's Market. With our new online storefront, uh, which we got some help from the Hannah Grimes Center's Pandemic Pivot Fund to fund our, our online storefront, customers can go online, choose from a variety of membership chip options, and then pick up their gelato monthly at the Hannah Grimes Marketplace in downtown Keene. And that's starting up next week. In the first eight months of 2020, Frisky Cow Gelato sales have increased 75% over the same period last year. We brought on 15 new wholesale accounts, including, including three Hannaford stores. We brought on a sales associate that's hel helping us to acquire new wholesale accounts in the Burlington, Vermont market. We um, are getting ready to hire a, our first employee, um, after me that is, um, in October. We are working with two new distributors to start getting uh, our product into outlets in Massachusetts, Northwestern Mass, and Eastern New Hampshire beginning in the spring of 2021. And we've gotten a number of new sales leads from a feature article that we recently had in the August issue of Business New Hampshire Magazine. Frisky Cow Gelato is a radically local product. 80% of our ingredients come from within 100 miles of Keene. We utilize local businesses like Mascoma Bank, local service providers like our distributor Food Connects out of Brattleboro, and local farms like Monadnock Berries in Troy, Cheshire Garden in Winchester, and as an aspiring B Corp, we are dedicated to keeping our carbon footprint as small as possible and continuing to donate to local nonprofit organizations. Frisky Cow Gelato relies on a diverse team of advisors and now employees to help us grow the business. From instructors at Carpajani's Gelato University, yes, I went to gelato school, uh, to a student advisory committee at Keene State College. We utilize the expertise of more than 50 champions to help us grow the business. The total addressable market in our current distribution footprint for take-home containers of premium ice cream is about $45 million annually. In the table on the right, you can see our financial plan for addressing 50% of that market over the next four years and gaining a 1.5% share in that market to reach sales of $338,000 by the end of 2024. 
In the early part of this year, we reached break even. I was able to take my first paycheck in August of this year. The new Gelato Club will be up and running next week. Retail sales are booming. We'll bring on a part-time employee in October. We are well on our way to achieving our B Corp certification by the end of the year. And we have raised 15,000 towards the 25,000 that we need to purchase a larger and more energy efficient milk pasteurizer. This equipment will allow us to double the amount of gelato that we can make at one time, increasing our productivity and helping us with our efficiency. Frisky Cow Gelato is a radically rural business with a radically local product. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Linda. Now the judges have five minutes for Q&A. Do, do, do you mentioned the, um, the new piece of equipment will uh, use a double output. Will that require any more employees to run it, or is it the same amount of employees and basically double the output for that amount of time? Yes, same amount of employees, but double, double the output. Yep, it's just a much larger vat to make the base from. Great discussion about the use of funds if you win this competition. How did you raise the 15000 toward that piece of equipment? Yeah, um, put together a proposal for what we needed and started shopping it around to friends, family, um, folks that have been, you know, kind of uh, supporters of the business since the beginning. And how did you market your, uh, your club? When, when you had to pivot, how, how do people find out about that? Yes, uh, so I do have flyers in the room here for anybody that might be interested. Uh, of course, social media, I have a whole promotional campaign that's uh, happening on Instagram and Facebook right now to generate um, interest in the club. Uh, I also worked at the Keene Farmers Market all summer, and so I built up a clientele that now want to transition to the online membership, and they, they're, you know, they're already actively doing that. Um, do you do any of your own distribution, or um, is it mainly through distributors? Yes. I do do some of my own uh, distribution and um, I work with a local uh, pig farmer in town uh, to, he has a wonderful refrigerator truck. And uh, so we have partnered to do some self distribution um, in some stores that either uh, Food Connects is not able to uh, get to, or just for different reasons, wanted more of a direct uh, connection with me. You mentioned an extended team of 50 team members. <clears throat> Can you tell me um, the ideas that these team members bring to you and maybe how they have assisted you in over the last few months or in your business? To yeah. How, how do you want to it? I mean, absolutely. You know, it really is a very diverse team. I mean, I'm, I'm making a, a product that involves pasteurizing milk. So I have a number of contacts at the, in the state of New Hampshire to help me maneuver all of the um, policies and procedures around that. Um, and especially as I grow the business, I really need those people to help me to adhere to the protocols of the that are required by the state. Um, I've worked with, um, you know, various business coaches that anytime I get, you know, an issue presents itself, um, I'm like, all right, who do I know that I can go to and, you know, run this by them and ask some questions. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always open. I, I am not somebody who thinks I have all the answers or know exactly what to do. I need help. And that's why I've cultivated these relationships with a, a, just a diverse group of people to be able to get access to their brains to help me go to that next level. Another one. Um, you talked about the expansion potential up, up to the next three or, or so years. I, I think you have told us that you are producing at Stonewall Farm. The question I have is, as that business 
Rose, do you need a commercial kitchen? Can they can they support you as that grows? What would the future look like? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, Susan, because you know, I've I've heard from many entrepreneurs. It's easy to start a business. It's not so easy to scale a business up. And I'm very well aware of the, the challenges of that, which is really why I need all these people in my corner helping me out. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways I could go with this. For example, I don't have to pasteurize the milk. I could work with a larger uh, dairy, like for example, McNamara Dairy. And you know, they're a pretty big dairy uh, located a little north of here. And I could contract with them to make my base and then not necessarily need a New Hampshire licensed creamery. All I would need is a commercial kitchen and could work with local um, officials to be able to get licensed for that. So there's lots of different ways that I'm looking at right now to be able to do that, that scale up. And um, I'm really right in the thick of that right now because I'm really at the point where I do need to um, to scale up. You know, like my, my younger son who went to gelato school uh, said to me, mom, it's time to go big or go home. And I'm going big. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for that engaging, dis engaging discussion. And thank you, judges, for the questions. Next up, we'll hear from... Next up, we'll hear from Steve Savage from V Squared Guitar System. Folks, what's the difference between an invention and an innovation? Well, to me, an invention solves a problem, whereas innovation creates new possibilities, new creativity, new opportunity. And nothing embodies that notion more for me than the Fender Stratocaster guitar. You can find this guitar pretty much anywhere in the world for sale, essentially as it was 65 years ago when it was introduced by Leo Fender. It's known as the guitar that changed music, it changed culture, it changed the world. And what was truly unique about this is the tremolo system. Jeff Beck is here, he's the inspiration for our work. And Jeff is truly a magician when it comes to the tremolo bar. But you know what, it's not really a tremolo because tremolo means a change in volume. What this does is change the pitch. As you push it toward the body, you increase the pitch or the tone of the guitar. We're not in use, swing it out of the way. Well, what we've done is taken this swing it out of the way motion and modified it so now it has a function to do what it actually claimed to do, control the volume of the guitar. And we are able to do this in a simple, intuitive and invisible way. What do you get when you combine vibrato and volume? Well, you get a, a, a tonal effect that's as different in combination as is the color green from yellow and blue. Now an innovator has to be an inventor and go through all the process, the engineering, the prototyping, protecting your idea of the patent, and getting here where we are today, trying to move on to the branding and the marketing. 
But true, the true reward in this is watching an artist do with your invention what you could not do yourself. Our first artist was Kapitanabe, talented uh, Japanese guitarist who uh, he traveled with Chaka Khan. He took our guitar on a world tour. This picture here is him performing live on MTV. Also, uh, Dovidas is an international guitarist and he did a YouTube video calling our innovation the greatest since the floating bridge. Well, that would take us back six and a half decades. Also, he garnered uh, 27,000 views with this video and that got a lot of inquiries for us. But let me show you what this sounds like. I'll let Stacy Mitchart from Nashville introduce some of the sounds that are available. So you can see it lends itself to many different genres of music because it's a tool, it's not an effect. So this is Tony playing one of our prototype guitars. So we do this with a kit. And uh, I said it was invisible, and it is because every guitar with a tremolo has a backing like this on the back. We take this off, replace it with our own enclosure. Inside this enclosure is a rechargeable battery, our circuit, you can charge it with a phone charger, as well as a magnet, the electromagnetic sensor, and the uh, electronic equipment to go with it. We want it to be invisible because we wanted the audience to even be scratching their heads as to how this is possible. So we create the kit, it can be installed on any guitar that has a tremolo system for $117. And we expect to get this price down quite a bit with when we can take advantage of the economy of scale. We sell it for $350, which is the price of a, a effects box, which there are 1.35 million sold last year with the profits of $85 million. So the question is, how can you estimate what a market is for a product that's never been out there? So being conservative, we took one guitar company, Fender, one model of Stratocaster, looked at one year of annual sales, 50,000. And if we could get 1% of that market, it would give us profits of $116,000. If we could get 5%, $587,000. But that doesn't look at all the guitars out there that could be retrofit. In fact, 2.5 million guitars are sold in the United States alone annually, and 12 million are sold worldwide. We're also always looking for a license agreement where uh, um, OEM can take advantage of their processes and get these costs down by about 60%. Now the health of the uh, economy for guitars now, it's surprising. 2020 is estimated to be the greatest year in Fender guitar history. And this was in an article September 8th in the New York Times quoting Andy Mooney of Fender Guitars. But let me go out with a little more Tony Campanolo. But first, I'd like to th thank all the collaborators in the area that have gotten us to this point, including the Hannah Graham Center. Thank you very much. We hope to carry these collaborators with us as we go into production. Now, this is Tony, and you can see, I think. But well, anyway, Tony finds a bit of a old Opry style with his guitar. And we provide a product, we provide an invention, we provide an innovation that we hope will find its own legacy in music. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Let's hear from our judges now. Steve. Susan. I, I know that you um, have sold some of these. Have you got some traction at this point? Have you, do you feel like it's momentum? Yes. Started? Yeah, we have um, one of those um, guitarists. His name is Scott Laflamme. He's performing every weekend. He tells me after every show, he has at least 10 people coming up asking him how to do that. So, yeah, we are having a lot of traction. Our problem is in just the production side of it because all these kits so far we've been making with uh, 3D printers. We just got the, uh, the plastic extrusion part done and we're ready to go just to brand and get the online sales. 
And what would it take you to get to get that manufacturing process going? Well, really, it, it's done. You know, the last piece was that enclosure, that plastic enclosure. What we, we need to do is brand market and get this out there. And we want to do start with online sales, as well as approach some of the companies that may be interested. Thanks. Um, I think your growth uh, from your first presentation to today's was amazing. You did a really, really good pitch today. I was very impressed. So. Thank you. Great job. Thank Great you. job. Awesome. I have a question. Yes, Roy. Um, so you talk about collaborators and especially local suppliers. I think that's great and, and maybe the connection to community. Mm -hmm. How do you integrate those into your team for executing your business? Well, first of all, those are the people that helped us get here, not only with ideas, but, you know, production. Um, so when we ramp up production, we hope to use those same people that we used to get here, you know, because we, we really we're, we appreciate it and gratify what they've done for us. To get us here. Thanks. Jim? You, you mentioned you'll be able to get costs down. Um, yes. Because when you start selling through distributors and things like that, mm -hmm. you'll need more profit margin. Any idea of like, how, how many you need to produce before you start reducing that $117 production cost down to? Yeah, if we could do 500 for example, right now we're paying almost $50 per circuit. And so, I mean, a circuit is electronics, electronics are cheap. So if we could, we could do 500 or 1,000 of these, we'd get those prices well below 50%. Well below 50% of the 117? Of, what, of the $50 that we're paying now per circuit. Yeah. Got it. And we have a local company. We have the circuits produced. We give it to them, and they put on the components. So that's, that's not cheap either. Thanks. Do you already have a website? Or? Yes, we do. Oh. V squared volume terminal or true V volume terminal. You get to see me again, and I'm a little embarrassed about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really push it. But that's one of the things we need to do, is get that online, uh, social media, get it really ramped up. So, Steve, is that what you want to use the money for? Should yes, ma'am. Yes, thanks. Anybody else? No? Well, yeah. thank you very much, folks. Thanks, Steve, for your musical presentation, and thank you, judges, for your feedbacks and questions.
The judges have scored, and next up, we're going to hear from Wangane Hall about global village cuisine. Hi, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I am Wangane Hall from Global Village Cuisine, and today, I'm here to talk to you about ready-made meals and samosas that our customers love. So today, I'm going to talk to you about three things. <clears throat> One, I'm going to talk to you about how a family business from Vermont started making African food for everyone. Two, I'm going to tell you about what we make and why that matters. Three, I'm going to tell you about the equipment that we need to expand from New England to across the East Coast and why $10,000 from Hannah Grimes is an essential part of that process. And so first, let me tell you about who we are. My mom, Damaris Hall, who you see pictured here, is a trained chef from Kenya. And she and my dad started an African restaurant in downtown White River Junction, Vermont. They make recipes from all across Africa that our customers loved. And eventually, this became a product that is now in Natural Foods Co-ops and in Whole Foods. That product is ready-made meals and samosas with bold African flavor. These are authentic African recipes. They're allergy friendly. They're made with vegan and gluten free options and locally sourced ingredients. So that means that from meat eaters to vegans and everyone in between, this is food you'll love. Now you can find our products in three crucial places. You can find us in the freezer section of Whole Foods across New England, and that's great if you want to feed a family. You can find us in the deli sections or the grab and go sections of natural food co ops if you just want a quick, tasty lunch for a second. For a samosa, you can also find us online through our e-commerce site where we ship our meals and our samosas straight to your doorstep for the ultimate delicious convenience. What matters and the common denominator is that we're meeting real customer needs. This matters because we are in a space where money is being spent and we are at the intersection of three trends that are rising. Our competitors in the space have been able to take advantage of this. You have Amy's and Saffron Road in the freezer section, and you have Freshly and Daily Harvest in e-commerce. But what they can't do that Global Village Cuisine can is authentic African recipes that are allergy-friendly, vegan, and gluten-free options. What also helps, helps us stand out is our commitment to social causes. We think of what we do as food to bring culture and profit to do good. We support nonprofits like The Water Project, which is a New Hampshire-based nonprofit that brings clean water to villages across Kenya. And we also donate our meals to our local hospital, Dartmouth Hitchcock, and the Listen Center, our local community food bank. We're able to do all of this because of the surge in demand in our business. But to keep growing, we need equipment. $10,000 would go towards equipment that would automate our samosa making and our meals packaging. This would increase our productivity by a factor of five, which would allow us to quickly fuel our business growth. Without equipment, our growth is limited. Currently, we make everything by hand in our commercial kitchen. But with equipment, we'll be able to purchase equipment that's going to increase our productivity and allow us to scale rapidly. We expect that with equipment, we'll be able to see an increase in revenue of 75% by 2022 for total revenues of over $400,000. Lastly, I want to tell you about, next I want to tell you about who we are and how we're going to do this. We're a team. You have my mom, Damaris Hall, who makes the recipes. My dad, Melvin, who has the sales relationships at Whole Foods and Natural Co-ops. My brother, Bazaar, who takes the photos, and myself, who tells the brand story. We also have a kitchen crew. We get business support from the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and we're just finishing up a four-month accelerator through Wyndham Grows, with the completion and the end result being a strategic growth plan. This growth plan is our roadmap for how we're going to expand down the East Coast in retail and e-commerce. We want to take major markets, New York, Philadelphia, Washington and Atlanta, and we want to take smaller cities across the East Coast as well. We already have a product in New England, as you can see from the dots on the map, and we've done well there. We have a product that customers already love. But with equipment, we'll be able to increase our efficiencies and expand 
down the East Coast. Now, I believe that we can do this because we have a track record of accomplishments. Our story is already being told by National Food Cops and by Whole Foods, by our distribution relationships, through Shopify, Associated Grocers of New England, and Associated Buyers, and through press outlets like the Boston Globe, New York Magazine, and Healthline. And so when you invest, you'll be part of the story of how a family business from Vermont was able to bring African food to everyone. I am Wangane Hall from Global Village Cuisine. Thank you, and at this time, I'll take any questions you have. Thanks, Wangane. Let's hear from our judges now. Um, yes. Can you, can you reiterate for us how long you've been in business and what the grand plan is for this, this large expansion that I hear you talking about? Yes, absolutely. So we started out as a restaurant in downtown Over Junction. Um, that was an iteration of the business, but for Global Village Cuisine, this current iteration, we've been in business for four years. And in terms of the grand plan for expansion, uh, we already have market share in New England, and so we just want to take that down the East Coast um, with our line of meals and samosas. So what will it require in terms of staffing and commercial space? So we have a commercial kitchen already, um, and we have a team of seven. Um, so once we get equipment, we'll be able to increase our productivity with no increase, um, <clears throat> with, no, with the same number of employees. Uh, and uh, once we're able to do that, we're able to see the revenue growth from there, then we want to hire employees from our local community uh, so that we can continue to fuel that business growth. And we want to, after we kind of... Uh, basically supercharge our kitchen staff, then we want to hire sales, and then we want to hire marketing. You yeah. mentioned the um, mention of 5X uh, productivity increase with mm -hmm. the new equipment. What is the, and then the $10,000 for doing that, what is the total cost of those two, two pieces of Right. So the uh, total cost of the equipment is $40,000. What we would use the $10,000 as a down payment for a lease to purchase program. Um, and that would, again, allow us to increase the efficiencies of the business. Um, but in these types of situations, the lease to purchase program is very common. Mm -hmm. um, can you said you. Uh plan to grow down the East Coast? Yes. Um, are you guys fully saturated in like, the current market that you're in, or are you just planning to grow in specific stores? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So, um, the territory that you currently um, sell to, yes. uh, do you feel you're just mainly just sell Whole Foods, or and like some natural food stores, do you feel like you're fully saturated in the market, um, selling to all of the different stores that you would like to in your current territory? Ah, okay, I understand. So for us, uh, Whole Foods and Natural Food Co-ops are kind of where our customer is. Uh, we tend to have a slightly more upscale customer who wants a premium natural food experience. And so Whole Foods and Natural Co-ops have been a really, really good fit for us. So we kind of want to expand that down the East Coast. Uh, but eventually we would be fine going to the conventional grocery aisle, but just in the natural food store aisle. Yeah. Can, can you talk about some revenue? What's your current revenue rate? We saw the growth mm -hmm. plans, but what, where are you currently as a demonstration of traction? Yeah, so our current revenue, um, do you want numbers or rate? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so our current revenue is about $250,000, and our current revenue increase is about 20 to 30% year over year. Um, so we do see an increase, but again, right now we're actually having to be careful about how we fill our orders. We can't fill all the demand that we're getting from our distributors, um, and we kind of, but if we could fill our demand from our distributors, that's the kind of projected revenue we would see. It appears that you are donating to a water project and meals and other things. Yeah. Um, 
if you won the prize, would there be further community benefit or just further your, your uh, what, what would you see as far as? Yeah, so we want, great question. If we want to further our community benefit by hiring locally. Um, we, again, our three uh, kitchen staff, like those are kind of local people, local communities, we'd want to increase that. Um, and we'd also want to increase the percentage of locally sourced ingredients that we have in our meals right now. What is your current locally sourced ingredient percentage? Yeah, so I would say it's been between 10 to 15% right now. Um, but we do want to increase that kind of over time. Uh, but right now, because the high cost of production per piece, we have to kind of source it slightly more conventionally. But again, if we could increase the uh, increase our efficiencies, we'd be able to source more locally. Well, thanks, Wangane, uh, for your amazing pitch. And thank you, judges, for your great questions. Last but not the least, I'd like to welcome Chris Dabrowski to present Lumen Mesh. Hello, my name is Chris Dabrowski and my company is Lumen Mesh. We are a solid state lighting company that focuses on the assembly and wholesale distribution of color tunable fixtures that are wirelessly controlled by Bluetooth low energy mesh networks. Or to put it a simpler way, our lights change color throughout the day and you can control thousands of them with just your cell phone. The challenge that the industry faces today is that legacy lighting systems typically only provide one spectrum of light, a warm 3000K or a cool without 5000K, and whichever you pick, you're stuck with. And then when you do want to upgrade to a dynamic solid state lighting system, the options are very confusing. If you go to a lighting manufacturer and say, hey, I want this light, they're gonna say, okay, go to a network, network lighting control company and find your control system. And you have to figure out, are they gonna to work together? Is the system gonna do what you want it to? And once you do find that system that works for you, someone in your organization will probably have to spend weeks or months figuring out that control system. And if they any issues arise, they have to learn how to troubleshoot it or commission new lights to the network. And it can be a very steep learning curve. Here's an example of a lighting manufacturing company, Orion Energy Systems. So if you go to them and say, I want one of your lights, but I want it to be controlled wirelessly, this is the web page that you see. And you can tell it's pretty confusing. You almost have to be an industry expert to understand, uh, are these network control systems gonna do what I want? Are they gonna work with these lights? Or your other option is to pay a lighting control specialist a crazy fee to design the system for you. The Lumen Match system aims to solve these problems by providing fixtures that have two colors built in, so they'll automatically adjust those colors and that color spectrum throughout the day. 
based on your GPS location in the world and um, the time of year. Uh, our uh, fixtures are plug and play, so the lighting components, the lighting control systems, and the network control systems are all built into the fixtures, so the customer just has to hang it up, bring power to it, and they're good to go. The control system is very simple to use. It's a company called Kasami that's based out of Finland. Um, with your phone, a simple tap will turn the lights on, uh, a swipe will adjust the color temperature, and another tap shuts them off. So it's very user friendly for anybody to pick up and adjust anything uh, on the fly. And also the system, again, will automatically adjust color temperature to give you the right light at the right time of day. We've been following the research being done into circadian rhythms for about four years now. And it's pretty well established that humans need blue light. We need 480 nanometers during the day to stop melatonin production and keep us more alert and active. And then in the evenings, we need to remove 480 nanometers so our bodies start producing melatonin again and get us ready to go to bed. And based on our experience, we found that that change needs to happen seamlessly. Uh, initial generations of tunable fixtures required that the user turn the light off and on to adjust color. We found that they just weren't doing that. And one thing that I've noticed since learning about the way the receptors in our eyes take in light and how it affects our bodies is I'll be driving around at night and see somebody's you know, second floor hallway or bedroom light. And it's this crazy bright blue light. And I just want to sometimes stop and say, hey, you got to shut that off, get a warm light in here. It's preventing you from going to bed. Um, so I think that's part of our goal as a company is also to educate people and uh, have them understand how light impacts our bodies and how it can be harmful or helpful on the reverse side. So we estimate that there's about 38 billion square feet of addressable market. So over the next 10 years, this is commercial real estate space that will convert to solid state lighting. Our goal is to grab a 1% share of that market and then eventually move into the consumer market. Uh, the commercial market is much simpler from an inventory management standpoint. Consumer market, you have to carry a lot more fixtures and that kind of takes a, a bigger company and a little more experience. So we're gonna focus on the commercial real estate sector to begin with. It's much simpler for us. Um, and based on that market share, we see a huge cash infusion coming from around the company into the Monotonop region, into our company. Instead of that money going out to big national companies like GE or Sylvania, we want that money to come into the Monotonop region. And based on that, um, our uh, growth strategy, a good marketing strategy in that five, five year range, we can see 25 to 30 full-time employees coming on to help us out. Um, and that's Monadnock region employees. We won't have to go out to Boston or New York to, to, or to recruit. We can tap into the great labor force in the Monadnock region to hire these employees. The team currently consists of myself and my father, Paul. We've been in the industry for about five years now. And we've worked with a lot of companies from around the world. Kasambi again is from Finland. Um, Long Young and Justin Power are Chinese companies that help us refine our components so that we get the, the best experience for our users in a, in a small, great package. Hannah Grimes has been an awesome partner for us. Not only they've been a customer of ours, but also again as a partner, promoting our company, um, getting us into the Radley Rural events and the Connect events and really get, helping to get our name out there. So we hope to continue that relationship with Hannah Grimes and then hopefully one day you know, be a donor and give back and give back to Hannah Grimes since they've helped us so much. Currently we've done a couple of prototype installations, the biggest being here at Hannah Grimes where we learned a lot about our fixtures and what our um, customers would see for challenges and how we could refine those fixtures to improve that user experience. Uh, we're currently finalizing the design of our linear luminaire again to get all the components in there the right way and as user friendly as possible. We're also developing a UVC based luminaire that will use the mesh networks um, to help with disinfection. Uh, looking ahead, we would use the Pitchfork Cash Award to develop a web based interface to work with the Kasambi app, which would have two major benefits. One, our users would be able to see the energy use of each individual fixture in their network and then be able to optimize the system accordingly. If they notice that one hallway or one room is using a ton of energy, they can adjust that scheduling or adjust those settings uh, accordingly. And then also, um, we'd be able to print out energy usage report reports for the utilities who incentivize that so that they can see the data and make decisions. So it would increase the incentives from about $60 for our linear light up to about $150 for our linear and my name is Chris Frisky. My company is Lumen Mesh. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. Let's hear uh, hear from our judges for the questions. Chris, can you talk a little bit about um, 
your current manufacturing process? Do you do you have a facility? Do you rent space in a facility? What do you need to to do this? That's question number one. Question number two has to do pandemic related. We all know that a lot of places are discovering that they can have their, their employees at home. That's going to limit some of your potential commercial space because they're not going to want that commercial space. So are you counting for that in your numbers? So we're currently renting at 310 Marlboro Street, um, which has the building has a lot more room for expansion when we when we need it. Right now, we are bringing in components. Most of the components in the lighting industry are made in China. That's where all the reactors are. That's where everything started. So we're bringing in co custom made components and doing the assembly there um, at our facility. So it would be mostly just uh, expanding more into that building, expanding our you know equipment handling. Uh, equipment, sorry, material handling equipment, and that sort of just kind of expansion that way. Um, so we've, last year we figured uh, the market, the total square footage that's not converted is 77 billion, it's estimated a few years ago. We figured probably 30% would never upgrade for whatever reason. Now we're thinking probably 50% would never upgrade. So obviously a lot of people are working from home now, but you still have warehousing and manufacturing and a lot of other businesses that can't move to remote work. So we still think the potential is huge there. And then again, like I touched on briefly, our goal would be to expand into consumer sales, but that's kind of uh, a different beast when it comes to inventory management and all the different colors that people would want for their homes where businesses are a lot easier. One fixture, you know, can do, you can do a thousand of them throughout a building. So it's a lot easier for inventory. I'm wondering about um, from an intellectual property perspective, um, are you basically taking lots of stand, lots of several standard points and putting them together? Is there a is there a manufacturing piece of this, or we are taking? Figure out the ability for others to sort of fit the market. Um, we don't have any IP at the moment. Um, we will, I think, with app developing more in the app and custom features in the app. Right now, we're taking relatively standard components and customizing them with the manufacturer so they fit inside our fixture. They can be color tunable at the right, you know, milliamps and voltage and things like that. So we've been, that's what we've been doing for over the last year. The last couple of months, we've really gotten it down into the, the fixture package that we want. So it's customizing somewhat standard components that, um, and putting it in an all-in-one package where most of the other options available are taking a light and taking an external external driver, which is actually what we did at here at Hannah Grimes here. We had external components that were difficult to do, not a simple installation, so we're trying to refine everything down. So it's it's customizing standard things, and then I think in the future, um, app development, web-based app, will have some, I think, intellectual property where we can do some special things with, with the control system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, you talk about so the camp runs as a location for testing out your system, essentially. And it sounds like you're at the prototype phase, but do you have commercial installations or do you have any demonstrated traction? Uh, especially? Not yet. The Hannah Grimes was our biggest installation, and that was, again, a, more of a prototype. We were still refining the system. Um, we haven't nailed that down 100% yet, so we haven't been pushing commercial sales yet, but we're, we're very close there. We, uh, on having everything nailed down and all our processes ready to go, where we we would push more. Thanks. What what are the plans for expanding and growing your team to assemble and uh, maximize on your market potential? Yep. So it would be um, kind of figure it out as we go a little bit, have a rough plan in place. You know, it depends on how quickly the growth comes, but we need, you know, uh, more administrative staff, certainly more assembly staff, more warehousing staff. Um, so it's just see what we can handle for volume right now and then hopefully quickly bring in a lot more people. Certainly, I, we have a rough idea of what we want to do for expansion, but um, haven't nailed down exactly the exact time frame. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your presentation, and thank you, judges, for your questions.
with that, we are wrapping up the first part of the session. Thank you to the entrepreneurs for your compelling business pitches. And let's give all the presenters and our judges a big round of applause. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to Radically Rural and supporting small business entrepreneurs. We hope you've enjoyed listening to the pitches. We'll, we'll, we will now move into part two of our session, our Pitchfork session guide, so that you can learn how to do something like this in your own community. And then we're going to return for our third and final part of the session, where we'll hear a little bit from our pitchers and then announce the winners. Okay, are we live? Sounds like we are, I Dave. I think we are. <laughs> everybody? <laughs> um, great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this section of the uh, Pitchfork Challenge uh, session. And I just want to say a warm thank you to the pitchers who put themselves out there. It's a really scary thing. They've spent a lot of time working on their pitches. For those of us who have been able to watch them from the beginning to this moment, it's an extraordinary transformation and it's due to a lot of hard work. And also to our judges who help with that work along the way and the staff. Um, so, you know, uh, good job to all of them. It was really heartwarming to watch. Uh, so speaking of the staff, I'll introduce the uh, people on the screen with me today. Kate Kirchhofer is our former program director uh, and actually started with this group. Uh, she is now living in Philadelphia. Uh, so Sarah Powell took over her position and continued with, uh, with this group. And the other person joining us today is Dave Diesel with David George Communications. Uh, Dave has uh, worked with Hannah Grimes for years in marketing and other things, but uh, most recently is helping us put together uh, the Pitchfork Guide. So thank you both for, for joining. And so I'm going to start and open and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we did this, how it came about, what it is, some of the lessons we've learned, uh, and uh, you know, just maybe some advice of how to work through all of this. Uh, Kate will then come on and really talk about how it runs and some nuances uh, that probably aren't gonna show up in the guide. And then Dave will come on and really just give you the nuts and bolts of, of the guide. Um, so, uh, you know, I think tying into the opening keynote, I hope uh, folks got to see that, but uh, Pitchfork for us really is just an idea friendly, um, it was, it's idea friendly, we just got started. We saw a need and we just got started. And we hope for those of you listening today that are planning to do something like this in your community that you take that to heart and just get started. We have a guide, it has lots of details. Uh, some of them may be useful for what you wanna do and some may not, but just do it and just get going. 
The reason we started it, uh, there was an article in 2016 uh, in the Washington Journal by Jim Tankersley, and it really talked about how the startup rate in rural communities had fallen off a cliff, uh, which was the truth. And one of the main reasons cited for that was uh, the lack of financing for rural businesses. So by the fall of 2016, we just, you know, waded into this issue and we started uh, our pitchfork challenge. We, from the beginning, wanted it to be fun and friendly and rural. It wasn't going to be Shark Tank. It wasn't going to be um, uh, scary. It was meant to be supportive. We, as an organization, did not feel like we had the skills to, or the capacity to, to uh, teach our uh, entrepreneurs to pitch, and we wanted to build that capacity. Uh, so we have done that over the years, and we've gotten better and better at it. Kate really helped hone that uh, piece for Hannah Grimes, that capacity. The second thing we wanted to do clearly was to increase funding for startups, and uh, uh, we have also done that. Uh, the third thing that we feel that Pitchfork does for us is it really raises the visibility of starting and growing businesses in our community. It creates some buzz, it is fun, people come and see it. It's really kind of a community event and it's fun and so people get to know if there's going to be a restaurant opening or a new brewery opening they kind of know way in advance and i do think people attending like to be on the inside track and know those things and for the people who are pitching in addition to really getting to the essence of what their business is and communicating it really well and thinking carefully about some of the business pieces that um they get to actually get some early customers and get some excitement uh, ready um, for them. Um, the, the, uh, kind of an overlying thing too is that for people in the community that are attending Pitchfork or funding prizes uh, and doing things like that, it's actually an opportunity to put your money where your mouth is. And if you want certain kinds of businesses in your community, you can get them by supporting them through an event like Pitchfork, highlighting them, giving them visibility, and giving them the support they need to start. Um, one of the, um, so yet you know, I just wanted to throw a quick number out there from the Kaufman Foundation, but um, venture capital, uh, classic venture capital, accounts for one half of 1% of funding for businesses that hire in this country. So it is really small. I think we hear a lot about it, but it really, it doesn't figure in. And in particular, in communities that are rural, it, it does not figure in. 64% of um, startups are using their own money. Um, uh, business loans from banks are only 16%. So there's a lot of gap and there's a lot of room to put an infusion of local money into local businesses. And we felt like Pitchfork was uh, a, a way to do that. So what is Pitchfork? I think that gets into that a little bit. It was really just our attempt to match local entrepreneurs with local sources of funding. Um, we wanted it, as I mentioned, to be friendly and supportive. Uh, we want it to actually be, It's for us, it's a business program. We bring a business from one end of being able to pitch about their business, which is what is so heartwarming about seeing these final pitches. From the beginning to the end, there's a real difference. Um, and I think the process not only helps hone the business and how they present the business, but it builds a really new sense of confidence in the entrepreneurs themselves that, and, and their friends and family who are watching it. Some, sometimes I think uh, when you're starting a rural business, uh, it's and you're doing it on your kitchen table. Your family can kind of uh, friends and family not take it as seriously. I think as if they see this, like, wow, that's that's a real business. So, so that's uh, another thing that comes out of that. Uh, one clear point I want to make is that we have two things going, and you're seeing one of them today. So our pitchfork event is what happens in our community year round. It does not have a cash prize. The Pitchfork Challenge is an event that we built um, for Radically Rural that has a cash prize. So it has the judges and it has things like that. Um, so we are talking today about the Pitchfork Challenge, the guide that you're going to receive today. It is posted on eureka.biz, by the way, already is about Pitchfork Challenge. Our Pitchfork event 
which is more uh, intended to fill the room with local community people that could potentially invest and community organizations that could potentially invest, uh, like local financing organizations, banks, uh, individuals, all of that, like they all go into the room and people just interested in hearing about new businesses in the community. Um, we've made it light and friendly to stay out of the crosshairs of the SEC. So we are not um, uh, judging for um, uh, uh, accredited investors. Anybody can enter that room because we're not making deals that night. We are talking about businesses and opportunities. Um, so it's also more about, uh, it's more than the money. Uh, often from these events, what we've seen was somebody needed space uh, to do their business on top of money. And somebody said, I've got an old barn. We'd love for you to use it. Um, I have a piece of property that we would love for you to use. Uh, I have a cousin in Boston who does this. Let me connect you. So, you know, that buzz, those other connections, different types of resources are really just pile in into that room in, in the, the evening. Um, the other thing we've learned is that this is just needs to be flexible over time. Um, we, as you saw today, uh, one of our idea track uh, people over this process learned that there was a legal issue with her business and she had to drop out. She'll probably be back next fall, but you need to roll with things like that. Um, uh, Margaret, who did present in the idea track, uh, had a terrific issue finding childcare for the presentation of prizes. I think she finally found something, but it was possible that she might not have been able to accept that. And that is all a part of the entrepreneurial process, that if you're running something like this, you really need to be prepared, to be supportive, and just to, to be able to wing it and step in. Um, I think one last thing that I'm going to leave a note on is how very difficult it is. There are not a lot of startups in rural communities to get people to, to actually get people in the first place, but then also to get them to do something like this. It is a tremendous act of courage. So I think building it over time, making sure that it is friendly and invitive and supporting um, is, uh, is very important. So with that, um, I, oh, I'd also like to share that we, um, that the local that you're seeing actually on the screen says local investing Monadnock style, but we have a generic version of that that just says local investing, bit short, local investing. You're also welcome to use that if you run this program or create something of your own. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the guide is available on eureka.biz where we're gonna be sharing everything. I'll pass it over to you, Kate. Okay, thanks. Um, so now you know how we got to where we are today. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, some insights that we learned when we created the Pitchfork Challenge. Uh, this is now the third year running and then how to really prepare for something like this. So a really a key takeaway, which I think you can probably get is that it's a really fun event. Um, it's incredibly inspiring. You get to see these really courageous entrepreneurs um, create an idea have an idea, share it and grow um, right in front of you um, throughout the, the weeks of planning and coaching with them. So the reward is really huge. Um, and it's just fun to see, you know, blossoming business leaders. So a couple of things to consider, um, especially for a rural area, um, which Keene, New Hampshire is, is that it's really important to start marketing the pitch challenge as early and as often as you can. So it's really, it's fun to think about um, the the pitchers and to get them excited and get them interested and peaked for um, uh, the application process in January because they're probably not thinking about pitching in September and January, but that time, as we all know, really flies. So it's really important to be uh, out there early with the pitch competition, create some buzz, encourage folks, get them excited about it. And something that what we always say too is, um, the win, everybody wins when they're pitching because they are, they're being coached on how to do a really professional, concise um, presentation about their business idea or business uh, opportunity. And they get exposed to a larger audience. They never know who's in that audience. It could be somebody who could be a potential investor, a potential business advisor, can connect them to somebody really important. Um, and then also 
you know, obviously it's, it, there is one prize for each track. So there is one award and that's the cherry on top if you are able to, but really the win is about having those uh, opportunities to present your business and have those conversations. Um, in marketing, you wanna think about who do you wanna partner with? So you wanna, to help you recruit your applicants, um, to help you recruit those um, potential advisors and judges. So think about your uh, local chamber of commerce, your bank friends, your maker spaces, your local regional economic development corporations, your local SBDC office, if you have them, um, churches, you know, you never really know Everyone probably has a business idea or a few. And so you never really know who who you could be reaching. And so you want to really diversify who you're reaching out to. Um, and then another thing in terms of, you know, the stylization of of our pitch competition, that's certainly one of the things you want to think about. What's the theme? What's the vibe? What's the how do you really want to create this and, and move move businesses along? And so, as Mariana said before, we really wanted to make this an encouraging, supportive and uh, an engaging um, program for the pitchers and for the community. And so with that in mind, because when you say pitch competition, most folks say, oh, like Shark Tank. And it's like, yes, it's like Shark Tank, but not quite so bitey. Um, and we really wanna make sure that the entrepreneurs understand that this is as much support as they want, we will be there to support them. Um, whether it's their script, whether it's their PowerPoint slide deck, um, it's fine tuning that that verbiage. It's a little rehearsal time, whatever they want. That's what we're there for to make that make sure that they feel successful and showing up. Um, and also in terms of how we select our judges, you know, we want to make sure our judges understand what the goal is and and um, that they understand it's a supportive environment and it's a teaching environment. Um, so that's really some big like marketing promotions work ahead of the actual pitching. And then I'll just say a couple other things about, so we do run a pitch clinic for folks who have never presented before. And even for folks who have presented before, it's always nice to get a little uh, brush up on that. And this is also the first time that the entrepreneurs are are meeting each other for the first time. And so we really just have uh, some best practices with them. But also we, I will say, we talk a little bit about how to handle your Q&A period as well with the judges. Uh, this is not the first time that they're handling the Q&A. So sometimes at first it can be a little um, jarring to take questions about, um, about your passion project, about your business. Um, and so that's a little bit of coaching in the pitch clinic that we do as well. For round one, it's a closed pitch environment. So there's no public audience. It is for the judges. It is the very first time that the presenters will pitch to the judges. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, um, build up to this, to this, because it's the very first time we're all meeting each other and hearing, hearing the actual pitch. And I would say, um, I guess two things that we say that I think that are uh, important at the beginning of this closed round pitch is that um, in the room when everybody's there, we say that um, first of all, just because of timing and logistics, that the judges will do the Q&A period very quickly. And so just to remember that to receive that the questions and the feedback um, in, in a way that's interpreted in a way of uh, for encouragement, but also learning and growth for the next round. And then also we say that the judges can and probably will contradict each other at times. So different um, different uh, judges might have differing opinions about, you know, the market traction or their go to market strategy or or something. And so it's OK to have that disagreement. And in the end, that the entrepreneur should um, and is the one who will be handling that feedback and say, this is what makes sense for me in terms of the feedback. This didn't quite make sense for me. I, I understand where the judge is coming from, but um, I'm going to take this part and leave the rest because in the end, the, it's the entrepreneur's journey. Um, and so I think giving that permission in, in front of everybody uh, gives everybody that a little relaxation of like, oh, I don't know if I should say this because I don't totally agree. And that's great because we like that. We like to have that discussion in front of the entrepreneurs as well. 
Okay. So round one, we don't always, um, we don't always eliminate, um, but that's up to you guys. Semifinals. I just want to wrap up because I just have two minutes here that the semifinals is the first time where um, the entrepreneurs will pitch in front of a live audience. And in fact, you can see the semifinals um, that were live streamed uh, just a few weeks ago up on the Eureka platform. So you can see how much their pitches have changed from semifinals to finals. Um, and this is an elimination round, uh, the semifinal round typically. And then for the finals, you know, it's much, it's very much like the, the semifinals. It is the big one because it's the award. Um, you're also adding an MC typically into the mix. You know, you want to make sure that you have them, um, uh, getting a good sense of what their role is and how the how the program and the event works um, and all throughout this I would just say you really just want to make sure that your communication is really consistent it's been clear it's been frequent enough um, to make sure that everyone is in cadence and and knows what's coming up um, and they can you know search for your emails really easily um, and also I would say you know the final point I would say is that you know, the person running this program is is going to be the encourager, the, the cheerleader, the hype person, and a little bit of a PowerPoint guru as well, which you can Google almost anything and find out. Um, but I will just say it's it's so fun to be part of their story. It's part of the to be part of the success of their next step. And um, it's a whole lot of fun. And I highly encourage folks to take take up the pitchfork challenge in their town. And then I'm going to pass it over to Dave Diesel, who will talk about the Pitchfork Challenge Guide. All right. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Pitchfork Program Guide uh, is in development right now. We've got a piece of it done. Uh, and the guide uh, is, is going to document and lay out in detail what Kate has just uh, summarized. It's a how-to manual that will take you through every step of the way for you to use to develop your very own pitchfork event or pitchfork challenge. Uh, when it's finalized, right now the program guide that's available today um, focuses on the pitchfork challenge, which is what we've been seeing today. It's the competition with a cash award. Um, the other form <clears throat> that uh, Marianne referred to will be added when the, when the guide is finalized. It'll include also the pitchfork event. Uh, and as Marianne mentioned, there are no judges, no competition, no cash award. But a lot of the uh, essential intent uh, in many of the steps are the same, whether you're doing a challenge or an event. But with an event, uh, the emphasis is on networking and connecting entrepreneurs with potential investors, lenders, customers, uh, resources, community support. Um, as you consider Pitchfork for your community and review the program guide, uh, I want to emphasize uh, four things. First, there's a lot of information in the guide. We've really tried to break it down step by step by step, piece by piece by piece. Uh, there is, it, it's a 26 week timeline from start to finish. And really the best way to begin is to just sit down and just read the uh, program guide cover to cover first to get a general sense of everything. It's a little bit like scanning a recipe. Uh, before you jump into step one, read it through and then go back uh, for specifics. The second thing uh, is that it is really critical that you be very clear uh, about your goals. Start with strategy and start with your why. Why, you know, what do you want to accomplish in hosting a pitchfork? What does success look like for you? Uh, and a real quick example of that is uh, uh, a couple of years into Pitchfork for Hannah Grimes, that's when we decided to add the, uh, add the idea track because we wanted to create a forum for people who didn't have an operating track record and who were just developing and forming their ideas. Um, so we made that adaptation. Um, the... And, and just to sort of wrap up that thought, the, the, the more that you define and articulate what your strategy is and what you're trying to accomplish, the easier it will be to make decisions further on, uh, further on down the road and implement your pitchfork. The third thing that I want to emphasize 
is uh, that this program guide is definitely a, here's what we've done. You, you know, here's what we think we've learned, nothing more. So please, please, please feel free to take what you need, uh, improvise, edit, uh, and adapt. The program guide is not a rigid formulaic set of, set of rules and must do's. Um, like a good recipe, it can and it should be adapted to suit the unique needs of your town, your county, your local economy, uh, and, and, and your culture. So it, it really, there's plenty of flexibility to make it yours and to make it what you need to be. The other thing is that things will change over time. So what works the first time you run a pitchfork may need to be refreshed or changed, you know, the fifth time that you run it. Also, as we well know with the pandemic, things change can change suddenly. So for example, this year, um, we were aware that a lot of businesses were pivoting and rethinking and had to pivot uh, and rethink. So one of our criteria is that, or has been that a business uh, needed to be less than three years old to participate. And this year, because of the pandemic, we just we decided to drop that criteria. Um, so we have that flexibility and I would encourage you to use the program guide like a, like a recipe, adapt it to your needs. The, uh, the fourth thing that I want to emphasize is, uh, and this has been touched on, but I want to, I want to just kind of hit it one more time, um, communication, coaching, and marketing. Um, consistent step-by-step -step communication with your pitchers and with your judges is absolutely vital. You, you, you can almost never send out enough uh, reminders about next steps, reminders about deadlines and dates, checklists. Uh, you, you need to, to stay in front of people and let them know where they're at in the process. Uh, coaching and guidance really, really is one of, the, one of the most important things that raises Pitchfork above the level of just a typical contest of some sort. Hannah Grimes uses the expertise of its staff and a network of pro bono coaches to offer ongoing advice, guidance, and suggestions to the pitchers. And this includes um, content, uh, uh, like help with really better understanding their financials or their target market or their operations and logistics. And it also includes coaching and, and counsel in terms of uh, presentation style organization of slides and that sort of thing. Um, so this, this, this atmosphere, this sense of coaching and developing is really, really important. It's the culture of Pitchfork, and it's a resource that we try to encourage um, all of our participants to engage in. And the, the bigger point of Pitchfork really is to grow businesses, to see them evolve and become better. So that the coach, so the coaching element is, in, is incredibly important. Um, Marketing, Kate touched on that. Um, Hannah Grimes really aggressively promotes marketing, uh, the event throughout the community, throughout that 26 week period. Not only are you looking to attra attract applicants and sponsors and create some buzz, um, but it also increases visibility in your community uh, in, in, in an interesting way from the point of view of, of uh, positioning your, your community as, as a place that is known where startups and entrepreneurs can thrive. Um, finally, I just wanna leave you with a little bit of um, sort of housekeeping information. The program guide is available on Eureka.biz in the Radically Rural Group area. And there's also a chat room there. Eureka has a trade show booth on Hoppin in the booth area, check that out. I think that's the easiest way to get in today. So just go right there um, in, the, uh, in the expo section. Uh, and, and look for Eureka. Um, please use this platform to give us your feedback. That'll be really helpful so that this can become a living document for other, other communities to use. Um, feel free to ask questions there as well. And when we update the program guide, um, you'll, you'll always be able to find the latest edition there. So thanks very much. Uh, we look forward to your feedback and seeing other communities organize a pitchfork. So I'm not going to hand it back to Kate and uh, 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 ramp up to uh, being in a position to announce the winners. Kate. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we are getting closer uh, to the big announcement. So um, obviously, this is all what we've kind of been waiting for. I'm sure the the presenters are are nervously 
um, on the edge of their seat as well. Um, so I'm excited to hear who the judges have selected um, for this year's uh, Pitchfork Challenge Award winners. Um, I am gonna hand over this next part actually to uh, back to our MC uh, Pooja, who will announce the winners. Um, and also before she announces the winners, we're actually going to hear from a few of the pitchers themselves uh, just to talk about their experience through the Pitchfork Challenge this year. So I'm gonna actually send it back to Pooja. Welcome back. I hope you all got some great ideas for your community. The judges have been busy deliberating and have chosen the winners. But first, we'll take a few minutes to hear from the pitchers about the experience participating in the process and then have our sponsors present the prizes. So I'd like to invite Margaret, Linda, Steve, Wangana, and Chris up on the stage. The support has been really amazing throughout the process and 
It was incredible to learn how to talk about my business. Uh, for me, uh, spreading the word about Frisky Cal Gelato and being able to talk to potential new investors and also just getting the valuable feedback from uh, the judges, uh, the staff here, and, and fellow entrepreneurs. So I'm trying to promote sort of a niche idea, and what's really helped me is to sort of hone my message so I can promote that to non-musicians, and you guys have really brought that what is essential to my my pitch, and I appreciate it. Great. So I think the biggest thing for me was uh, just great feedback from the judges, being able to share about Global Village Cuisine and how we're you know, sharing our meals and how that message is really coming across. But also getting to be part of an ecosystem of other local entrepreneurs and getting to see how vibrant that community is. I think it was a great uh, kind of learning lesson to understand how to refine your business idea down into a short, concise sentence to be able to communicate it easier to people that aren't doing it every day, so they uh, definitely have no idea, or you kind of sometimes make assumptions that people know what you're talking about and they don't, so it's good to get that feedback. Um, and then also just to feel like you have a support system, it's been really great to, to work with all the judges and also everybody here at Handograms. Thank you, pitchers. Now I'd like to ask you guys to go and get, grab your seat, and I'd like to invite Sarah up on the stage to uh, introduce the sponsors. Hello, everybody. We just got done deliberating uh, who the winners are here today, and it was really great. And the judges just wanted me to communicate to you all that it was a really tough decision. So we've been working with these pitchers um, over the last eight weeks and helping coach them so that they can communicate their business um, to the world. And so it was just astounding to see the progress that they've all made um, step by step and to see these final pitches today. Um, it made the judges' job really hard. I think they were um, just really, really um, in awe of all of you and the progress that you've made um, and the quality of the pitches that we heard here today. So thank you so much um, for being so courageous and coming forward to take part in this process with all of us here at Hannah Grimes and the community of um, Key, New Hampshire. And now, without further ado, um, I will bring up first Scott Young from Mascoma Bank, and he will um, present the award for our idea track today. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Young with Mascoma Bank. Mascoma Bank is different by design. In part, uh, we're very proud of being a B corporation and being acknowledged as one of the top 10% for the world. Additionally, as a mutual, uh, we are able to impact force for positive change in our communities and happy to give back 10% of our revenues as being a mutual. Thank you for having us here today. Congratulations to everybody. I think the ideas that you have put forth uh, are extremely exciting and uh, we appreciate Mascoma being included. So uh, for our um, winner for the, Idea let me, thank you very much. For the uh, business idea track winner, uh, we are pleased to announce that Margaret Foster for Little Lantern Pediatric Sleep Consulting is one. Congratulations, Margaret. It's well deserved awesome. We're really excited for you and to continue working with you and your next steps for your business. Um, next, I'd like to um, bring up Jeremy Stanizzi from the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority to introduce and congratulate our small business track winner here today. Hello, my name is Jeremy Stanizzi. I'm the Senior Credit Officer for the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority. We are the state's economic development organization that focuses specifically on business finance. Um, we do that through partnering with our local lending institutions and banks like Mascoma Bank to put together loan products to uh, make credit available to businesses and nonprofits throughout the state. Um, our, our mission is to foster economic development here in the state of New Hampshire and in turn create jobs through our loan products. 
Um, you know, Radically Rural fits into our mission in a big way because it shows that big ideas come out of rural environments. And, you know, New Hampshire's a true testament to that. We're happy to sponsor this event, you know, because the Hannah Grimes Center specifically nurtures those big ideas into, into you know, bigger and more viable operations. And we're happy to be a part of that. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to announce the winner. So the winner for the Rural Small Business Track um, is Linda Rubin, Frisky Cow Gelato. entrepreneurs and um, Linda and Margaret. Um, I'd like to thanks again to our judges, our courageous pitchers, the attendees, and to our generous sponsors. We hope you've enjoyed today's session and have gotten some good ideas for how to host an event like this in your own community. Also, stay tuned for the afternoon session of Radically Rural beginning at 2 p.m. Anybody that has any more questions for our um, Pitchfork Challenge organizers, you can feel free to hop back on and uh, talk with them for the next 10 minutes. They'll be available um, for some Q&A. So thanks again for everybody who tuned in and we uh, look forward to learning more about what you're going to do in your own communities. Thank you so much. Hey there, I think uh, I think that we are gathering up Kate. There's Kate and Marianne, I believe. And uh, even though the session is formally over, we do have a little bit of time. And we thought if you were interested, we would just make ourselves available to answer any questions that anyone had. So we'll keep an eye on the chat, but um, A, I just like, that's such an amazing feeling. I actually got to run upstairs and, oh, good. and live it. And, um, you know, for those of you who are still listening, or maybe I'm just talking to Dave and Kate, who knows? <laughs> but um, uh, interestingly enough, Cow Gelato presented our first year um, and was not a winner um, and, and is back. So I think to Dave's point about like flexibility and things can change, you know, normally uh, Frisky Cow would have at this point have been too many years in business to have um, qualified for this year, but because of the pandemic pivot, and certainly she is pivoting, she she got to do it again. So, so that that was um, really cool to see her win. Although I, I I'm glad I wasn't the judge uh, because uh, they all oh every one of those businesses just you know the cool thing is is that they're all gonna I think continue and be businesses. Um, they, they just won't have this $10,000. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they can I, always I, apply for next year too. And I think sure. sometimes yeah. we see that where I, another year makes a big difference in what they're able to convey and show their market traction and growth and capabilities. Yeah, and I, I just feel I have to share this, that I saw all three rounds of pitches mm -hmm. from the very first to the semifinal to today's final. And, for, for all of them, the transformation is, was just remarkable. I mean, they were they were generally good to start, but now it's, it, I feel like they're so much better equipped, sort of win or lose, lose. Um, I, I just think that they're so much better equipped to speak about their business and, and they have a much clearer sense of where they're heading and, and what they need to do to get there. Yeah, so we've got a, a, a comment from Varden. Um, Varda and I completely agree that that it's grit and honestly, you know, like um, I mentioned this briefly, but for, for Margaret, um, she's got a the baby of her own and for her to and then having the other person drop out. So she was the only contestant in the idea track, I think was really challenging for her. And I, I think uh, Sarah and I both agreed, like, 
this morning to when she finally did get a, um, a babysitter for this afternoon, which in a pandemic is hard because you can't just have anybody watching your kid. Um, um, I, I just felt like she's got the grit that, that it's, that's going to take. She does, does what she needs to do, but it really came down to it. So I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat. Um, we've got about seven minutes to the top of the hour, but we could also just sign off so we're not just listening to ourselves talk. <laughs> yeah, I don't see anything in chat, Marianne, right now. Yeah. Um, a couple of nice shout outs from Varden. Yep. So I think we can probably just um, uh, mute and turn off our cameras and upstairs drum will probably pull, pull us off of the stage eventually. All so right. cool. Kate and Dave, thank you, thank you. Kate, thank you, thank you for starting all of this. Thank you for building the capacity at Hannah Grimes to do this so very well. And Dave, you've been along for the journey for so many years and you know, really captured the process really well. And just, so thank you for being part of today and yeah. sharing that. Well, thanks for inviting us to help out. Glad to be part of it. All right. Have fun Bye -bye. this afternoon. Yep.